Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's issues, trends, and views from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening I'm joined by Sue Caro, the chairman of the Alameda County Republican Party, and she's going to be talking with us this evening about lessons learned from the 2012 election and her personal opinions on what the Republican Party needs to do to grow strength, not only in California, but nationally, if we can draw it out of her. Sue, <laughs> thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me, Chris. So tell us a little bit about you and how you got started with the Republican Party and how you rose to power in Alameda County. <laughs> it's a pretty short story, to be frank. <laughs> um, but I'm a lifelong Republican. I started in uh, where I grew up in Akron, Ohio. I was a teenage Republican. Then I was a college Republican. Then I was active on a few campaigns at a grassroots level before I went off and got married and started doing the homemaker thing and work and so forth. But recent years I came back to uh, some campaign politics and from there got involved at a local level in uh, Republican Women Federated Club and the Central Committee in Alameda County. So working on campaigns was kind of the gateway back in for you and then and accelerated from there. I think it was. You know, over my adult life I've lived in four different places, although in California now for 28 years. So um, I'm not a native Californian, but right. I've been here the longest. And so uh, when we're talking about the Republican Party, or Democrat Party for that matter, people have a different view on the outside of the world than they do when they start to get to the inner workings. Uh, I've talked to people on both sides who say, well, you know, um, I wish we just had a little bit more organization. I wish we had a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that. And, it, and inevitably, the opposite side says the same thing, and they're both in fear that the other one is more organized and going to get things done. What's been your experience, especially over the 2012 cycle? What did you see? What did you learn? Uh, what do you think needs to be worked on to strengthen the, the party? Boy, that's a big question. Um, since I am active in Alameda County, and Alameda County, uh, as far as California is concerned, has a fairly low Republican voter registration. Right. I, so I think what goes on in our county is probably very different than what's going on in Alpine County or Kern County, right. for example. Um, what I noticed right away is how much, as far as uh, campaign activity from the professionals, so that would be the campaign consultants and the donor uh, class and so forth, uh, they're very data-driven. And then we saw that, of course, with the presidential campaign. Right. So if you don't have a very high Republican registration in your county or your area, you're pretty much on your own to figure it out. There's right. not a lot of help coming from uh, larger organizations or other groups. Right. So, so that was eye-opening. Well, and you were the one that educated me about the fact that each of the individual county parties operates as an autonomous being of sorts. And people assume that there's a heavy tie from the national level or from the state level. And it almost seems like it's more of the Wild West when you look really underneath and see what's going on inside the party. Can you explain a little bit about how that works? Well, just looking at our bylaws, and every central committee uh, has pretty much the same or similar bylaws, we're uh, described as an independent and sovereign party. Right. So we work, of course... Uh, hand in glove with the state party, but we don't take our marching orders from the state party. Mm -hmm. And we try to be reflective and responsive to what our community needs, what our community looks like. Right. Um, being a Republican in Alameda County is very different than being a Republican in Orange County. Right. And so I know you and I have had the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of your frustrations, and one of the stereotypes is that uh, Republican Party is all for checkered pants wearing country club old rich white guy <laughs> types of scenarios. But that's frustrating to you. Tell us why. Well, just in the 2012 cycle, for example, I had a, um, a group of candidates that represented <laughs> all of the things that people think aren't Republicans. So I had a, uh, a Jewish woman running for assembly. I had a naturalized Mexican citizen man who came to this country at 12 years old, uh, running for um, uh, a school board position, and actually in the primary he ran for the state assembly. I had a Chinese woman running for Congress. And then, of course, I had, you know, uh, other kinds of people that 
uh, I had a trade union man. U union carpenter. Working, <laughs> yeah, that's right, running for office. So, so I didn't have a lot of old white guys running for office, and uh, we didn't spend a lot of time at the country club talking about how we were going to do things. <laughs> I've never smoked a cigar with you either. No. But <laughs> <laughs> so in looking at it, I mean, obviously the 2012 election is still fresh in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Um, what do you think, um, I mean, looking back, how would you do things differently when it, from a local level when it comes to things like supporting a presidential candidate and in the next cycle mm -hmm. it will be a gubernatorial candidate? potentially, um, and even the local races, what do you think the secret's going to be to strengthening the Bay Area for the Republican brand? Well, I do think there's some truth to the fact that we have not done a good job. Uh, we've, we've sort of uh, continued to do the same thing over and over again. Uh, you come and, you know, what all the things that I've done with the Republican Party have been a volunteer type uh, organization, been active as a volunteer, and that's what we do most of the time. We run based on a lot of volunteers. The Koch brothers don't own that? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, uh, and volunteer donations and volunteer time and volunteer partic participation at all levels is what's going on. Um, and so uh, I think because we continue to do the same thing, go back to the same people that have always been our, our good foot soldiers, we aren't doing a very good job. We aren't spending the time talking to those groups that we need to go to, that we need to get to. Um, I think there is truth to that. It isn't that blacks and Chinese and Mexican and, you know, citizens in our county aren't interested in the values that we espouse. It's that we're not even going there to their communities to talk to them right. and have the dialogue. And the reality is, is that the, uh, I mean, having experience as a candidate previously and talking to people, the Republican platform is actually well received when it's articulated. Oh yeah. But people don't, re as in, in our area, it's not always received well as soon as they figure out there's a Republican attached to it. Yeah. But they have the common value system, uh, hard work, yeah. secure, safe neighborhoods, strong educational yeah. values, fa true fairness. Right. Not redistribution of someone else's rights or wealth to someone else, but Opportunity. if you work for it, you get to keep it kind of a scenario and you can do better by your kids than you can, um, you, know, you can do better for your children than you could in other places. Mm -hmm. And so it's well received. Do you have strategy that you can share with us about <laughs> uh, reaching out to those kinds of communities? Well, uh, I would say that coalitions is one of what I call coalitions is my probably one of my larger strategies. And what I'm saying when I uh, what I mean when I say coalitions is finding those organizations who share uh, some of these values, who have some of the same goals. I don't assume that just the Republican Party or the, the, the uh, framework of the Republican Party is going to be enough in Alameda County to forward uh, some of these ideas and uh, to get uh, people to register as Republicans. So I've learned that there are a number of organizations who care about two or three issues. Mm -hmm. that are conservative issues. And um, we could easily work together on uh, some of those issues and also sort of cross-populate, if you will, mm -hmm. volunteers and who we know and activities towards registering voters and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like we need to own the message because I'm the, Repub I'm the face of the Republican Party in Alameda County. Right. Uh, when I say the message, I mean, of course, our conservative values. But so one of the, the common criticisms of the Republican Party, and not at just a local level, but at a national level, is owning the message has mm -hmm. been problematic. Are there any particular messages that you see going forward that need to be incorporated to give a boost to the, to the strength of the party? Well, I we aren't doing enough with education, Chris. Um, I think one of the things that I think has always been a little difficult for us as Republicans is because we are about individual rights and individual responsibility, personal responsibility, entrepreneurial uh, endeavor, people starting their own small business or, or whatever. 
what happens is we don't think collectively very much. We, we make a lot of assumptions that things are going to stay the same, the way we grew up, the way they were when we were starting off. Um, and they've been changing. And um, because we don't think collectively, we're, we're sort of at a loss when facing groups like the Democrats, mm -hmm. who think very collectively through their unions and their trade unions and, mm -hmm. and whatever. Um, and so um, I think we do have a messaging problem. Mm -hmm. But I think it's because we aren't as disciplined in a unified or collective fashion as the Democrats are. The word collective scares me. I know. Like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it sounds a little like communist Russia or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah but, I, but I think it's true because um, when, I mean, I'd love to be able to go to every registered Republican in Alameda County and say, give me $50 a month from your you know, paycheck because that will help me put good Republican candidates on the path to election. Yeah. Uh, but I can't do that. If you could turn the Republican Party into a union, you yeah. could just deduct it from their paycheck. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and we're a union shop state, so, you, yeah. know, that, you know, that would work. So, um, <laughs> I even sidetracked myself with that one. So, as far as, um, as messaging or inclusion of groups or, or that kind of thing, is there anything else that you think we need to address to, to draw people in? I hear constantly uh, about people saying we need to increase the size of the tent. Do you think that's a good idea? Do you think that's a bad idea? Or what does that mean to you? I don't want to become a Democrat light party. Okay. So, um, although I, we are a big tent and there's a range of con levels of conservatism, um, probably the biggest uh, criticism coming at us right now are the social issues. Um, and uh, so people divide over whether they think it's okay for the definition of marriage to be changed or it's okay for a woman's right to choose or not. Um, so some of these issues get in the way of some of the things we do agree on mm -hmm. and um, that find a larger audience. Even young people, which is another audience we're thinking, we're, we're you know, looking at ourselves and we're saying, how are we going to reach the next generation? Many of the next generation are what people call libertarian. That was my next. Republicans yeah. are libertarian in thought process. And what that means is the social issues they think are none of their business to get involved with. Those are people's private business, private issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they might agree on the fiscal issues. They don't want to inherit the big problems that are brewing in the state of California and nationally. Mm -hmm. um, so they get turned off because they think that we're an old-fashioned party that cares more about the definition of marriage than we care about the debt and the deficit. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because you bring up libertarianism, and I was going to bring that up because uh, when I've been out in the world in all places political, I've even done things such as crashing moveon.org protests. Good for you. Just to <laughs> see how the other half lives. And what's interesting is Ron Paul was popular even amongst the moveon.org people, mm -hmm. which is completely contrarian to what you would expect because he's all for individual responsibility and uh, the individual's rights. And a lot of the moveon.org types of strategies are more collectivist and more turning over power to the yeah. government. But the young people still do respond. And partially it's, I think, because of the war component. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, um, that they, they actually like Ron Paul, even at moveon.org. Right. Very interesting. Well, same thing with the Tea Party movement. The Tea Party movement actu uh, actually attracted, you know, uh, Democrats, uh, independents, and Republicans or conservatives. Right. And, uh, and that was the reason, again. It was about fiscal issues, debt regulation, debt and deficit, these issues, taxed enough already, Tea right. Party. But it wasn't about uh, the social issues so much. Right. So, um, so we have a we have probably a messaging issue there as right. far as how do we want to handle this? How do we want to pull uh, people into the conversation? Right. What's the most important thing for us to be talking about? And so, in your dealings with people, what do you see if you were looking forward into, let's say, a campaign was starting right now, mm -hmm. which technically it is, because as soon as one right. campaign's over, it's right into the next one. What are the top three issues that, if it if it were your world, you would like to see the Republican Party address going forward into the next cycle? 
Well, um, that's a good question. I think probably what we were just talking about. I'd like us to get unified behind a message. I remember uh, Meg Whitman, for example, used the theory that you could only do three things well. Uh, pick the three things you think you can work on and let's table the others for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to find whatever those three things are that we think we do well and get unified behind that message. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of research, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of data to support our arguments on a variety of things. Mm -hmm. The thing that we also come across as a lot of times is mean and mean-spirited and hateful. Why is that? Uh, I think it's because we take on some of the hard issues and we, we make some harsh calls. Um, certainly immigration, immigration reform is one that people think of Republicans as being very hateful and mean-spirited about. Uh, because we all know somebody that works in the yard or somebody that cleans our house or somebody's kid who's at school with our kid. Um, and we like those people or we feel sympathetic and compassionate for those people. And so uh, we don't want to have to deport those people or mm -hmm. something like that. So um, it is a big problem. It's a big problem for a lot of states. California has a huge financial commitment to the problems of uh, illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. And we aren't addressing it in a way that's helping the state in terms of its own solvency and its own problems. But that's not the only thing that's driving the problems of overspending and so forth in the state. But that's just one example, you know. Right. I, I think people feel that we're hateful and mean-spirited because we don't think that when two people fall in love, they should be allowed to get married, whoever they are. It's right. their private business. Right. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, uh, and the press loves to play with this. They mm -hmm. love to, you know, hit us over the head with this stuff. But, I mean, do you think it's partially the idea that the Republican Party won't defend itself from these attacks? They just say, oh, okay, yeah, sorry, and move on, versus, no, that's absolutely not the way it is. We're not going to let you get away with that. The reality is X, Y, and Z. Here are the facts to back it up. And I'm not, and I wouldn't expect that we would lead with illegal immigration and same-sex unions uh, <laughs> if we wanted to, to get the message out there. But yeah. how, how would... Um, Right now, we've got spending issues, yep. at, and a lot of times, as we've discussed previously, whatever the person running for president or in the other, other cycle running for governor mm -hmm. does, that's how all Republicans will be branded. All candidates who are on anyone's doorstep is going to automatically be associated with that. It seems to me that the Republican Party could focus on things such as individual liberties, on fiscal responsibility, and education, as an example, and true education reform and putting students first, as opposed to special interests, teachers' unions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But w how does the message get through if there's a scenario when, I mean, post-Bush, there were record deficits mm -hmm. and uh, after eight years, but then after three years, Obama did that all by himself. Um, do you think that there's some damage control that's necessary as far as uh, rolling back some of the big spending um, reputation that's been associated with the Republican Party of late? Well, you know, I can't, we, none of us can undo what was done in the past. Right. I think there's some fair criticism about the fact that once people get to Washington, they do, you know, Capitol Beltway think. They mm -hmm. forget almost where they come from, or they think they, they get, they uh, find out that to operate in that town, they have to be, they have to operate in a certain way, mm -hmm. or you can't change things overnight. It takes a long time, whatever their rationales are. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly they have been challenged again by the 2010 elections when so many freshman congressmen were elected from conservative, by conservatives. Um, and it may take a while. It's going to take a while to make a change. This is a humongous problem. Mm -hmm. I don't know if humongous is really a word, but it's a huge problem. And uh, it's not going to change overnight. In California, another huge challenge. Um, we don't own the media. We don't have a lot of control over how we're reported on and how uh, we're taken out of context. And mm -hmm. it's way over my pay grade how some of this messaging happens. Mm -hmm. Um, especially being just a county chairman. But um, again, I would go back to let's get unified behind what are the three things we think we can do well and let's just beat that drum
by, and let everybody beat that drum. Mm -hmm. well, we should own school choice. Mm -hmm. We should own changes and reforms in education, and we don't. Mm -hmm. And yet, I mean, the Democrats are beholden to the teachers' unions. Mm -hmm. They cannot cut that tie. The teachers' union elects them and demands uh, payback. And so uh, very little happens in reform with a Democratic-controlled legislature. Right now, we have what will be a Democratic supermajority in California. It's going to be very difficult. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that if we weren't unified behind the message of school choice and school reform and got behind it all across the state in every way, yet we wouldn't win or start to turn the tide in terms of some of these issues. Well, we only have two minutes left, approximately, so I'm going to let you choose the, <laughs> one of the last two questions. Number one, your personal opinions totally disclaimed about the fiscal cliff or the pros and cons of the Democrat supermajority in California. Well, I think there's plenty of punditry talking about the fiscal cliff, so I think I'll leave that one aside. <laughs> Good call. Well played. <laughs> the supermajority in California, I think, is going to be interesting. It won't actually take shape until at least six or seven months from now because uh, two Democratic senators got elected to Congress, and there will have to be special elections to fill those seats. Probably the people who will run for those two state Senate seats will be assembly people who will be Democrats. So there's a chance that there will have to be special elections there, too. But eventually we're going to have to deal with it. And I think the Democrats will overreach. Um, I think if we expect them to overreach, if we're ready, if we do the right work over the next two years, that uh, we might have some opportunities to start to turn that tide. One of the things that's true about the voting electorate is they really don't like one-party rule. They really like to have some kind of balance. And maybe the best pitch we make in 2014 is, do you want to keep going with one-party rule? Not that I haven't thought about it <laughs> in large scale, but yes, I agree with you. I think that, um, and that's one thing that the Republican Party has not been good at doing up until now, is placing proper ownership on a lot of the mess that we're in, right. directly where it, it lies. Yeah. So, just a few seconds left. How can people find out more about the Alameda County Party and uh, potentially reach out to you directly? Well, we have a Facebook page, and we have a website, alamedagop.org. Um, we're located, our office, our headquarters, we do have a permanent headquarters. We've owned the building we're in since the 70s. Uh, it's in San Leandro at 1039 MacArthur Boulevard. And we have monthly meetings, and they're open. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any emails if anybody wants to email me at chairman at alamedagop.org, chairman at alamedagop.org. Perfect. Thanks for joining us, Sue. Sure. Thanks for having me. And at this point, we'll take a quick break for a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. It is government 
versus the people. Am I right? Yeah. Look at the Electoral College example. Right? A leftist popular challenge to states' rights. You think the founders were brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing? By carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> And welcome back to the right side. That was a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. Not only does the Conservative Forum underwrite our show, they're also known for their speaker series that happens typically the first Tuesday of each month it, right here in Mountain View at 432 uh, Stirling Road at the IFES Portuguese Hall. And uh, as far as the upcoming schedule of speakers, in January, it does happen the second uh, Tuesday of the month as opposed to the first Tuesday because the first is going to be a hard day for some folks to wake up after partying the night before. But Yaron Brook from the uh, Ayn Rand Institute will be speaking that evening in February. Kevin Jackson of the Black Sphere will be speaking uh, as the designated um, guest speaker. In March, it's an educational forum on how we improve uh, educational achievement. In April, Dr. David Bob from Hillsdale. And in May, one that I'm particularly le looking forward to, Bill Whittle will be our guest. So if you need more information on those upcoming engagements, the conservativeforum.com is your place. And in closing, just in talking to Sue this evening, what we've learned is that the each of the county parties has their own little flavor and way of doing things, and they're not out there with a behemoth behind them to back them up in way, the way that many people would expect. So if you're unhappy with the Republican Party and you lean Republican as opposed to independent or another direction, definitely get involved locally because if you're upset, the way to make the biggest difference is to be involved. With that, we thank you for joining us this evening on The Right Side. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and I look forward to seeing you in person or on the show sometime soon. Thanks again for joining us. Good night.